Okay, so in these in, in this video, I'm, it's going to be an introduction to what I'm going to do in the next three videos, actually. And we're going to talk about the Doppler effect. Um, so let's just start off explaining what the idea is. You have a source of waves and um, sound waves. And let's say at time zero, the first wave front is emitted. And that's indicated here by this red dot right here. So what happens next? Well, the, that, that wave front will propagate outwards in space and it will arrive after some time TS, which is the time it takes the source to emit successive wave fronts. So it's the time between this is the first wave front, this is the second one. So at, after a time TS, the source emits the second wave front. And so that's basically what we're showing here. And uh, the second, the, the dis I mean, the distance between the first wave front and the second wave front, that's one wavelength. It's the distance that the wave moves in this amount of time, Ts. And we re can represent the wave by this kind of uh, cosine wave, uh, the way it looks here. And so it has a peak here that goes to a minimum, and there's a peak here. So the peak corresponds to where the second wave front is being emitted and the peak here corresponds to where the first wave front arrived at and the distance between those two peaks is one wavelength of the wave that we're talking about and if you wait for another amount of time ts so the total time now is 2 ts well the first wave front would have moved two two wavelengths away the second wave front would have moved one wavelength away, and then the third wave front would be emitted at that time. So that would be the situation. Now, it's just important to review what we mean by this cosine function or sine function that's being that's that's propagating. What does it mean exactly? It basically, if you look at you could you could think about it as a pressure wave that's moving out. What do you mean by that? Where there's a peak, you can imagine the pressure is higher there or the density of the air is higher there. Where there's a trough, where the, you get a minimum, you see the density of the air represented by this white part is lowest at that part. So again, it becomes highest here, dark becomes the highest here, this is the lowest, and again the highest here. So this is what we mean by this cosine wave or sine wave that's propagating out. Uh, it's, uh, it, it represents the propagation of the density, the dense region of, regions of air and the less dense regions of air, they propagate outwards. Now, does that mean that the molecules, the air molecules themselves propagate outwards? No, it doesn't mean that. The air particles themselves don't propagate outward in space. The air molecules actually, all what they do is just oscillate back and forth, back and forth around some equilibrium position. So what actually is propagating is this pressure wave, these regions of small and high, low and high density, those are the things that are propagating outwards. But the molecules themselves, the air molecules themselves are not propagating outwards. So what then would it mean that at this point in time you have a high dense region of high density over here? What does that mean? Well, that means that at that point in time, the molecules that are on the left, they moved to the right at that point in time. And the molecules on the right moved to the left. And so that's why the, this part is more dense. There's more particles there. But that doesn't mean that the particles themselves are propagating outwards because in the next instant of time, the, the, part, the particles that move to the right will then go back to the left and they will keep on oscillating back and forth. So it's very important to note that the particles themselves of the air are not propagating outwards, they're just oscillating. The thing that's propagating outward is this region of these regions of high and low density of air. Those are the things that are propagating outwards. So the wave front represents where the maximum happens. So there's the maximum, have maximum density here, maximum density here, maximum density here, for instance. That's what the wave front represents. And this part is explained in more detail in other parts when we talk about sound, sound, waves, uh, sound waves. I'm just here explaining the idea 
that's relevant for the Doppler effect that we're going to talk about in a while. <coughs> okay, so let's say you have a source that's stationary. The source is represented by this blue sphere or blue circle and it's stationary. And let's say at time zero it emits its first wave front. And the, the, the velocity of the wave front is represented by V sub W with the arrow attached to the wave front. That means this is the velocity of the wave front. So after a time TS, the period of the source, TS, S stands for source, the period of the source, the second wave front is emitted. So what happened to the first wave front? Well, it moved a distance one wavelength away during that amount of time. So that's what we represent here in this picture. Okay, what if you wait for another time TS? What will happen? Well, after that time TS, the third wave front will be emitted. The second wave front will have moved a distance one wavelength. The first wavelength, the first wave front would have moved a distance two wavelengths. And so that's what's happening at that point in time. Now, the speed of the wave itself, once the wave gets into the, into the air, it propagates and the speed doesn't depend on the source then in any, any way after that. So the, the, the speed of, this, of the sound wave only depends on the kind of material, the medium that it's propagating in. That's the, that's the kind of medium we're, we're going to be assuming when we talk about this problem. So once the wave gets out, it's propagated out, it's, pro, it's moving, the wavefront is moving, it, it has a certain speed that depends on, only on the material and in no way can the source then affect it once it's propagating outwards. So uh, let's say you wait after a certain number of time NTS, so after a certain number of periods have passed, represented by the number N. Well, this is what the situation is. You'll have um, many wave fronts propagated outward. I put here dots to represent the other ones that are not shown on the screen. And the frequency then of the source is basically the number of cycles over the total number, total time of all the cycles. So if you say you have n cycles emitted, then it's n over the time for all this, those n cycles. If the time for one cycle is t sub s, then the time for all the cycles is n t s. And so the frequency is also equal to one cycle over the time it takes for the source to emit the successive cycles. So just the time of one cycle. So the frequency of the source is also one over the period of the source. And the speed of the wave is the distance it travels in that amount of time, because that's basically what the speed of the wave is. It's the wavelength then over the time it takes for the source to emit the successive wave fronts or the period of the wave fronts. So it's the distance over the time. But remember, as I said, this speed depends only on the material. So that means that for a particular source period, with a, a source with a certain period, the wavelength will change depending on the kind of material. So the, the speed depends on the material. The wavelength then would depend on the material for a certain frequency. If you change the frequency, if you change, make the, the period longer or shorter, which affects the frequency, um, what will happen? Well, the speed is going to be the same in this kind of material, because we said the speed depends only on the material, but then the wavelength will, will have to change if the period changes to keep the speed always the same for that particular material. And if you want to write it then in terms of the frequency, because one over the, the period is the frequency, so you can write it also that the speed is the wavelength times the frequency of the source. So that's basically the fundamental equation for the speed in terms of the wavelength and the period and the frequency. Okay, we're going to then, uh, in the first video we're going to take, we're going to show what happens when you have the source at rest versus when the source moves to the right versus when the source moves to the left. If you look on the right side of the source in these three cases, you'll notice that the wavelength of the sound uh, changes. Look at the wavelength here and look at the wavelength when the source moves to the right. The wavelength gets shorter. 
look at the wavelength on the right side when the source moves to the left the wavelength gets longer so the way the source moves will affect the wavelength of the light of the of the sorry the sound that's emitted but once the wave fronts are emitted can we say that this wave front these wave fronts have a certain frequency can we ask this question does this question have any meaning well it turns out we can't really talk about the frequency of the propagating wave unless we have more information what is the extra information we need to know we need to know the measuring device that's going to measure the frequency is that device at rest or is it moving and we want to then explain why uh, does this make a difference when the detector is moving or at rest so I'll illustrate this just intuitively in the following slides but then in the next videos we'll explain exactly how the frequency depends on the movement of the detector itself so imagine you first these are these are some wave fronts these are successive wave fronts and this is the detector at rest and I'll show the animation as it progresses and look how the detector feels the wave fronts as they pass by the detector so the first one now passed by the second one passed by the third one passed by so the detector in this case is feeling the wave fronts come past it and the, the time between uh, wave fronts is a certain period so that's something that the detector perceives but what happens if the detector is moving so let's take the case now when the detector is going to move to the left while the wave goes to the right uh, what do you think will happen i mean let's see what happens you see that when the detector moves to the left the wave fronts hit faster so in other words the period between successive wave fronts is shorter and if the period is shorter one over a smaller number leads to a higher frequency so the detector will feel or it'll 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 feel that the, the the frequency of the wave is higher it'll perceive it to be higher okay what happens if the detector moves to the right watch the animation so as the detector moves to the right you can see now it hits the first wave front but look how long it takes for the second wave front to pass the detector because the detector is moving to the right too and so you can see when the detector moves to the right the time between successive wave fronts is bigger and so the frequency the perceived frequency is lower and so that's why i mentioned that you can't really talk about the frequency of the propagating wave because you need to know how the detector is moving because the movement of the detector will, will change the perceived frequency that it will perceive okay so uh, then we're going to deal with all different cases if the source is at rest the source is moving to the right the source is moving to the left the detector is at rest the detector is moving to the left the detector is moving to the right all the possible cases we're going to study in the next videos we're going to start so the, the, the first video after this one is going to start with the case where the source is at rest and the detector is at rest and will show that the frequency that the detector perceives is going to be exactly the same as the frequency that the source is emitting. Then in the, the video after that, we'll take the case where the source is moving either to the right or to the left. We'll, the, the answer will, that we get will be general for both cases, but the detector is at rest. And you can see here when the source is moving to the right, the the since the wavelength is shorter then the time it takes the detector to perceive successive wave fronts is shorter when the time is shorter the period is shorter then the frequency is larger so it will perceive a larger frequency and when the source moves to the left the wavelength will be longer and so the detector when it's at rest it'll it'll um, feel the wave fronts come to it come past it at a longer time so the period will be longer and so then the frequency will be shorter so that's what we're going to do in the video after the after the the next one
And then in the last video, we'll discuss the case where the detector could be moving any one, any what way you want, whether it's moving to the left or to the right or at rest, the result will be general for any kind of movement of the detector and the source. So that's the third, the last video. It'll discuss this general case.